Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q3 FY22 earnings conference call of Aditya Villa Capital Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Ajay Srinivasan, Chief Executive, Aditya Billa Capital. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening and welcome to everyone to this uh, Q3 earnings call for Aditya Billa Capital. I'm joined by senior members of the team and together we will present our results and take any questions that you might have. I trust you have a copy of the presentation with you as we might make some references to the slides there. Q3 continues the strong momentum we have seen across our businesses for some time now, with the Q3 consolidated PAT at 577 crores, double the PAT a year ago, on the back of strong disbursement and top line growth across our businesses. This PAT includes a gain of 161 crores on the sale of about 1% stake in our AMC business through the IPO in October 21. We had guided for over 1,500 crores of PAT this year, and we are well on track to deliver that. Slide four is a slide that demonstrates the result of our focus on the value drivers of our businesses. In our lending businesses, our focus on higher return segments has led to sharp increases in our margins, in fact, to the highest levels we've seen, with a consequent positive impact on our profit growth and our return on assets. In our asset management business, with the focus on growing our retail and equity mix, we have delivered strong margin expansion and profit growth and a high ROE. In our insurance businesses too, the focus on growth with the right product and channel mix has led to growth in margins and a strong delivery of value. As we continue with the strategy set out in each of these businesses, we will see continued improvements in all of these metrics. This of course was planned and was part of the strategy that we enunciated some time ago when we set out targets for each business for FY24. Slide five of the deck will show that over the last four years, we've made consistent progress in these metrics and are well on track to deliver the targets we set ahead of time. Slide six will show you the strong momentum over five years in both our revenue, which has grown at a cadre of 17% per annum over this period, and our PAC, which has grown by 30% per annum, excluding the gain from the AMC stake sale this quarter, to the highest ever quarterly profit that we have declared in this quarter. On the right of slide six, you would see the strong growth year on year across all of our businesses. Slide seven steps back a bit further in time to show the buildup of growth since FY17, but more importantly, the increasing momentum that we're being, that we're seeing in each of our businesses. You will notice from this slide that on a nine month basis, our PAT is up 67% year on year. As we deliver our guidance of FY22 profits, you will note that we would have delivered almost three times our PAT over the last five years. Slide eight sets out the various benefits our businesses enjoy being part of the ABC ecosystem, which underpins our growth, much of which we've discussed in the past and hence I won't repeat today. I would only like to call your attention to slide 10, which shows our own branch footprint across India and the initiative we're driving centrally at ABC to co-locate businesses in a single location so that we get cost and revenue synergy. In the next six months or so, we will have more than 150 locations where our businesses are co-located, driving annualized savings of something like 50 to 60 crores. With our expanded branch presence, we expect that there will be a branch of an ABC business in every town with more than 3 lakh population by March 2022. This geographic presence, in addition to the reach of our partners, gives us a distribution capacity and reach which is truly immense. In the last quarter, I have spoken about the transformation initiatives that we have undertaken across ABC including newer products and segments, the big push towards digitalization, ecosystem partnerships, analytics, and maximizing the synergy benefits across our platform. This has led to the growth in our customer base by over 40% year on year to over 31 million customers as of the end of Q3. This has also led to the growth momentum that I've described thus far, and as you can see in slide 14. You will notice from slide 14 the increased momentum across our businesses as the year-on-year -year growth is ahead of the three-year KGA for the metrics shown for each of the businesses on this slide. We are confident that our growth momentum will continue as we continue to expand our own distribution capacity, grow our partnerships, 
launch new products and segments, and leverage analytics. We are, in short, very well placed to continue our strong trajectory of profitable growth at Aditya Villa Capital. With that, let me hand over to Rakesh to take you through our lending businesses. So thanks, so thanks, Ajay, and good evening, everyone. I will now walk you through the performance of our lending businesses, NBFC and housing. In the NBFC business, we had a strong quarter three with our loan book growing 4% quarter on quarter and 9% year on year. NIMS hitting an all-time high of 6.24% and ROA of 2.3% in line to meet our guided numbers for FY24 ahead of time. As we have mentioned before, our focus in our NBFC business is on growing the higher margin retail and SME segments sustainably. As the environment normalized, we focused on building our business with our disbursement in the NBFC increasing by solid 34% over last quarter and 55% over quarter three last year. Bulk of these disbursements, almost 70% have been to the retail and SME segment. This is in line with our stated strategy. As a result of this, our SME plus retail book has now grown by 7% quarter on quarter. In fact, our retail and SME book now accounts for 60% of our total book, the highest it has ever been, with a 24% increase year on year. If I take you back by two years, these segments would have accounted for 51% of the book. Our focus on growing retail has resulted in our customer count growing 2x quarter on quarter to 2.3 million. Our focus on driving value through the product mix has led to continued upward momentum in our financial metrics. Our NIMS have expanded by 100 basis uh, year on year and 1.45% over three years to reach the highest margin we have seen in this quarter. Our net interest income has grown by 4.4% quarter on quarter and 30% year on year to 799 crores in quarter three. Margin expansion further supported with a continued focus on reducing cost income ratio has led to delivering a pack at 1.5x year on year, taking our ROA to 2.3%, which was 1.7% last year. The financial numbers bear out the fact that the strategy we are following is delivering the required result as we continue down this path will see better returns. Let me spend some time now setting out what has driven growth in the retail and SME segments and give you some sense of where we are headed. Like I described to you in the last quarter, our focus is on four essential pillars. Number one, product suite expansion with a strong customer focus. Number two, enhanced distribution capacity with increased productivity. Number three, cutting edge technology with faster implementation. And number four, strong risk management, catering to multiple product segments and delivering stable risk adjusted returns. Like I did in quarter two, I would like to share the progress we have made in these areas in this quarter. Starting with the retail segment, we are continuously evolving our product mix by increasing the contribution from new products like small ticket loans for the emerging income segments and customized ecosystem products like buy now, pay later, checkout financing, education loans, merchant loans, which now form 21% of our retail book mix compared to 6% two years back. We have increased our sourcing from digital and digital ecosystem channels to 46% as compared to 20% two years back. Our success with small ticket loan is driven by our last by our lean branch expansion strategy in tier three and tier four markets, we took our tier three, four footprint from 50% to 73% of our total branches and increased our AUM mix originating from these markets by 50% in the last two years. We increased our branch count to 126 this quarter with 73% presence in tier three and four, leading to the retail book from tier three and four markets growing by two X over the last two years. As we further expand to 150 locations in FY22 this financial year, primarily adding new locations in tier three and four markets, we will have the branch network to support our growth from direct sourcing in the retail business. We'll continue also to build our ecosystem partnerships 
to augment our sourcing capacity. From a technology perspective, we have a built best-in-class agile plug-and-play API spec stack that allows us to integrate seamlessly with diverse set of ecosystem partners and drive digital sourcing at scale. We have consistently implemented the best technologies available at each stage of the lending process, leading to favorable outcomes. With these investments, over 94% of our customer acquisitions and 97% of our EMI collections have gone through digital platforms. We have seen 86% of our customer service being catered to via digital interactions. All these capabilities have enabled exponential volume growth. The growth of our loan book has been accompanied by strong credit appraisal and risk management processes. We have put together a multi-pronged risk assessment strategy catering to the target customer segments, their context or moment of truth and the data available across public and third-party sources. Our diverse risk assessment practices include internally rated cash flow-based underwriting for corporate and mid-corporate and the SME segment, standardized program-driven underwriting for retail segment, and scorecard-based onboarding and underwriting for our digital source loans, with a very strong focus on collection framework. Hence, our exposures are diversified across sectors, customer segments, and products. We constantly review our concentration risk in the portfolio. Our strong underwriting capabilities and calibrated risk approach has helped us weather multiple macroeconomic risks. And as you can observe, we have consistently delivered stable risk-adjusted returns. While these initiatives will continue to be significant growth drivers for the retail segment, I would like to share how we have been thinking about the SME business going forward. It will be a combination strategy of leveraging the tier three and four penetration. We have achieved and establishing a digital MSME platform for sourcing from across the value chain. We plan to deepen our distribution with customized product offerings targeted to MSME customer basis industry, targeting clusters underserved by banks. We are overlaying our chosen industries and geographies in the SME segment to target specific micro markets for strengthening our presence in the sector geography SME clusters. We target 46 micro market locations with SME focus this financial year and plan to activate 120 such locations by FY24. Having successfully created a digital consumer lending platform, our MSME platform approach will focus on integrating with online B2B trade platforms, sellers, fintechs, especially for supply chain and other credit programs to serve customers from across the value chain. We expect our expansion strategy to yield 50 to 20% growth in the SME portfolio over the next 12 to 18 months. Our strong balance sheet, ample liquidity, low cost of borrowing, agility to integrate with partner APIs, strong processes, and bespoke product offerings provide us the right to win in our chosen segment. I would like to call out some of the key quality parameters on the overall book for the quarter. Our gross stage C book is at 3.9% with a healthy provision cover of 42% in line with the fact that we have almost 80% of our book which is secure. We have had good track record in resolution as we would have seen from prior guidance on this. And we expect a resolution of 350 to 370 crores of stage three assets over the next couple of quarters. Our collection efficiency has further improved to 98.8% better than last quarter as well our pre-COVID levels and we are confident that we will be able to sustain the quality of our book going forward. With our stage two portfolio going down, specifically the drastic reduction in 60 plus DPD book to 1.5% versus 2.3 in the previous quarter, an improvement in collection efficiency to better than pre-COVID levels, we are looking at an overall collection, we are looking at a much better financial performance for the next quarter. With a healthy capital adequacy, we plan to grow our loan book by 7 to 9% in the next quarter. Let me end by summing up on the NBFC front by saying that we are 
very well positioned to continue the strong momentum we have been building over the last few quarters, driven by our organic growth and the new growth engines in the retail and SME. With our current growth trajectory and continued focus on key segments, micro markets, products, direct sourcing channels, and deepening our digital ecosystem presence, we are confident we will achieve the target guided metric for FY24 ahead of time. I will now move to housing finance performance. Coming to the housing finance business, we, we saw a similar strong growth and disbursement in our target segment in our housing finance business. In this business, we have earlier stated that we are growing our affordable mix as we expect to drive superior returns. Quarter three disbursements were 12% over 12% growth over last quarter and 34% over last last year quarter three. Of this, the affordable segment disbursement mix was at 50%. This has taken the affordable mix to 35% from 23% previous year. We are targeting the affordable mix to be at around 40% by end of this financial year in line with the growth we had indicated earlier and the FY24 target. The shift in the segment mix supported by lower cost of borrowing has helped expand margins to 4.21, an increase of 75 bips over last year. Not only have our margins expanded, but our customer selection and calibrated underwriting strategy has helped risk-adjusted returns defined as NIM less, NIM minus credit costs expand by 126 basis points over the previous year. The housing finance pack was up by 39% year on year, taking our ROA to 1.8% and ROE to 13.7%. Growing our affordable book continues to be our focus and this is demonstrated in the segment growth over the last two years at and this has grown 40% compounded annual growth rate. We will continue to maintain the growth momentum in this segment going forward by expanding our branch footprint to at least 105 branches by March 22, with tier three and four presence increasing to 70% plus. We are adding sales headcount and we are hiring feet on the street to add uh, the distribution capacity for our affordable business. Direct sourcing is another, uh, another metric which we follow very closely and that is at a very healthy level at 76% in quarter three. And this ensures higher customer stickiness and we target to increase direct sourcing to 80% by March 22. Our progress in digital capabil capability gives us confidence with scaling up ecosystem partnership as an alternate source, sourcing, uh, sourcing channel. Last time, we talked about our pipeline and we already have five ecosystem partners under, under, under integration this quarter. On the technology front, we have made some good progress this quarter. We are the first housing finance company to enable customers to store loan-related documents in a DigiLocker, leading to a lower servicing turnaround time. We have completed the integration between sales management and customer onboarding app to enable end-to-end -end tracking of leads improved business predictability and field activity management. We have also enabled multi-channel servicing, including WhatsApp, eBots, Google Assistant, and self-serve port portal, leading to 77% of our customer interactions coming from the digital channel. Overall, 85% of our files are sourced digitally, and over 98% of housing finance collections are through the digital means. Coming to asset quality, we have maintained our gross NPA and provision cover at similar levels as last quarter. With over 30% reduction in our stage two portfolio from 314 crores, 314 crores in last quarter to 200 crores in quarter three, there is adequate liquidity. So that's a strong performance in terms of reduction of stage two. There is adequate liquidity in the business with a capital adequacy of 24.4% which is a healthy level to continue and to meet our growth momentum. With this, I would like to sum up, sum up the housing finance business. With this structured shift in our business mix, wider geographical footprint and increased distribution capacity, we expect to see continued expansion in our book, margins and profitability. We are already at the NIM and ROA we had targeted for FY24 and our focus is now on growth 
as the operating leverage will now improve these metrics further. With this, I will stop my presentation and hand it over to Bala for asset management business. And good morning, everyone. Um, as I presented in the AMC analyst uh, call, uh, I'll just repeat some of those subjects that we have given. So, the overall momentum point of view in AMC, we are maintaining the momentum of asset management through the founding person year on year uh, to close to about 3 lakh crores uh, size. On the back of continuous investment performance that we have delivered both on fixed income and equity. Overall, liquid asset management, which has now crossed 1 lakh 22 million crores, is again grows to about 39 percent year on year. The overall equity mix improved to 41 percent from 31 percent that we are using the similar quarter of previous year. The fixed income, we continue to maintain leadership position with the 1 lakh 22 million crores asset management, which is again grew by about 5 percent in a year on year basis. With respect to growing our uh, retail franchisee, uh, if you look at our slide, clearly we have now improved our number of customer base in terms of folios. From 7 million customer base, today we have about 7.5 million customer base. We have added about 9 lakh it is on folios that we have added in the 9 month period. And overall individual asset mix to the overall percent of AEM maintained about 48 percent, which again grew by about 14 percent to 1 lakh 41 million crores. Because B30, our continued effort in keeping the B30 focus. Uh, has helped us in maintaining a market share close to about 16 percent with the asset mix coming from B30 market, made them 16 percent. We also made a significant progress in our SAP AEM growth of 23 percent, which again grew by year on year basis. The new SAP registration has moved to 3.2 lakh crores per month in the Q3, as against the low that we had seen about 1 lakh 95,000 in the current year, which again grew by about 60 percent on year on year basis. With respect to uh, building our distribution network, uh, while we continue to keep our high focus on building our distribution network through our MFDs, banks and national distributors. We also now made some more progress with respect to our strategic partner tie-up with the FinTech platform. It's also helping us in adding more platform to our, uh, in our portfolio. Also increase the volume coming from the segment. With respect to the financial uh, performance, our operating revenue has now touched 334 crores. Again, 20% year on year uh, growth. In fact, our operating revenue average asset management as basis point has improved by 1.1 basis point to 44.4 to 43.3 of the previous year. PPG to average asset management as a basis point again has improved from 30 basis points last year to 33.1 basis points. In fact, our uh, profit after tax, the highest ever profit after tax we reported to 186 crores, which again 27% year on year growth, therefore leading to ROE of 31%. With respect to building our alternate uh, business, we have shown a significant improvement to one by the launch of many products under the ETF and passive category. In fact, uh, we have now created a 16 new product pipeline as of now, which will be launched over a period of the next six, uh, six months. Our assets and management and the passive has actually <laughs> gone up with three times from 1950 crores as of March 10 to about 5,000 crores as of December 2021. Our focus on building alternate business is also now further getting expanded in setting up our uh, Portfolio management service under the gift uh, which will help us in building products that can meet the global investors' needs that are investing in India. At the same time, we are also building our fundamental capability in the AF category in order to launch many products in this category as we move forward. With respect to our digital initiatives, um, of course, most of them are now business as usual kind of thing. And uh, having now stepped up our uh, digital transaction volume last year, we continue to see um, good transaction getting onboarded to the digital platform. With this, I stop and I hand it over to uh, Kamalesh Rao to run into the BSRI performance. Uh, thank you, Bala. Uh, at uh, insurance, the growth for ABSLI in the individual business has been 16% for the first nine months on the back of a similar growth the previous year. The good part about this growth is that it has been an entirely productivity-led growth. We have added people in our various channels in December will help us maintain this momentum not only for Q4, will allow us to grow faster in the next financial year. Our new product success continues and it has contributed to 41% of our business in the last 18 months. And our pre-approved from assured continues to give us a healthy 20% of our new business in this quarter. Our data models in PASA have now reached a stage where six out of 10 customers end up buying the propensity products that we create for them beforehand. Our average age of the customers being younger in the 36 to 37 years age has helped us immensely in our upsell initiative and 29% of our business this year has come from existing customers buying one more policy from us. 
Our group business grew 16% for the first nine months on the back of a 50% growth the previous year. And the AUM in this business is now at 15,350 crores. And in the profitable ULIP segment, we continue to be the second largest player. We were amongst the first few players to change our pricing this year. And that has helped the management of claims in the group term insurance business better through this year. Our annual premiums grew at a healthy 27% to the first nine months. And our digital capabilities allowed us to collect 86% of our renewal premium digitally in terms of NOP. We started a bot last year that we call Zara to collect renewal premiums. And whilst in nine months we have collected close to 300 crores, in Q3 alone, we were able to collect double of what we did in Q1. Bot alone, we believe now, will give us the capability to collect close to 1,000 crores next year. Our total premium at 8,066 crores grew at 23% over last year, and we will continue this trajectory of growth for the balance part of the year too. While that's the story of business numbers, the quality parameters have also consistently done well. Across, persist across persistency in the various buckets from the 13th month right up to the 61st month as well as our OPEX to premium ratio. OPEX to premium ratio which has seen slight increase for some peers during the COVID time has seen a downward trend for us and at 13.3% now and we will need our guidance on this for the end of year numbers. The firm now manages an AUM of close to 60,000 crores and we have had a great year on our investment management, doing better than the benchmark, as well as our peers, and in the top two quartiles on performance for majority of our funds. We managed our gross margins at 43%, and net margins were at 11.2%. Net margins in absolute amount was actually 2.2 times of last year, same time, and we are well on course to achieve 14% net VNB which means we are one year ahead of our guidance in this area given before. The performance on net VNB is an outcome of managing gross margins and expenses very efficiently. COVID claim for the first nine months was at 257 crores. And in spite of taking this hit, we have managed to grow our PBT by 14% as compared to last year. We are also carrying incremental provisions of 65 crores for COVID for the next quarter. And while numbers for COVID claims came down in quarter three, we will watch for this over the next three months. On the digital capabilities, some of the key highlights continue to do better. 95% of our customers we onboard digitally now. Close to 80% of our customer related services are now available online. In fact, in Q3, out of the total customer interactions that we had, 85% of them happened digitally and 40% of them actually happened through mobile. So overall, it has been a good year of strong growth of business for us with all our quality parameters doing well at well-managed OPEX, resulting in good growth and net margins for us. It's a large part of our growth coming out of productivity for the last nine months and the investments we have made in Q3 will help us sustain this growth momentum through this year and do better in the next financial year. With this now, I stop for life insurance and pass it on to Minds for Health Insurance. Thank you, Kamlesh, and a very good evening to all of you. Uh, at the health insurance business, we clearly continued on our growth momentum. We grew about 31% uh, in this quarter three, uh, year on year. And for the year, at 36% uh, year on year growth, our GWP now stands at close to 1,200 crores, uh, adding to our market share vis-a-vis -vis previous year. Not only is our retail franchise growing very fast, but at the same time, we are continuing to focus on and grow our profitable uh, group and corporate uh, business as well. Now we are covering about close to 17 million lives, uh, uh, more than 50% uh, uh, ahead of la where we ended last year at the same time. But at the same time, we, have been, we are consistently uh, moving uh, on, on the right track on our guidance towards demonstration of our superior financial viability of the model with our combined ratio coming down to 113% in our adjusted for COVID claims, vis-a-vis 115% the previous year. And we are on track to you know, demonstrate the viability by breaking in quarter four, uh, again, subject to the uh, COVID-3 uh, wave impact, which is uh, significantly lower in incidence and severity versus the first two quarters. What has driven this uh, strong uh, performance it clearly has been our differentiated health first business model, which is clearly directed towards not only acquiring customers at scale, but also 
demonstrating good, much and I would say much better claims performance vis-a-vis -vis our competitors. It has two simple components. One is how do we offer products which are more attractive to the younger and healthier customers, therefore, therefore improving the risk profile of our uh, health risk pool. And at the same time, once customers are uh, you know, onboarded with us, how do we work with them to reduce the health risk uh, impact which is results in claims over the period of uh, their relationship with us. We do that, that by clearly using health data that we acquire by investing in, in that process to stratify their health risk un under our proprietary score called well-being score and then based on where specific intervention in re is required by creating different cohorts of customers with different risk profile, we intervene suitably through our own interventions, through in-house uh, capabilities as well as through a whole string of partnerships that we have built in the health and wellness ecosystem which we have given in the subsequent slides where we use those interventions to bring down the health risk uh, of our customers. It is clearly demonstrated in the superior outcome for customers that we are able to engage. Clearly our average age of customers is younger by five years vis-a-vis -vis industry and our claims ratio lower by 5%, persistency higher by 26% for all engaged customers. So as we expand the efficacy of our uh, model, we will clearly consistently end up with a much lower claims ratio vis-a-vis -vis market. To make sure that we take this uh, superior uh, model of business to our customers at scale, we have a very diversified channel mix as I've shared in the past. We leverage the bank assurance model very heavily by going in there as a first mover. We today work with 12 banks with three more banks having added in the last quarter. But at the same time, having done that, we are now looking at investing significantly in expanding our agency uh, network leveraging the 1ABC branch concept that Ajay spoke about earlier, which not only gives us an ability to go to smaller locations at speed, but also doing that at a much lower cost than what our competitors would have done because it's co-located. At the same time, since we have invested in digital from the very beginning, we have used that to not only acquire customers at scale, but also engage with them. The acquisition uh, you know, of propensity is clearly demonstrated in the fact that our digital business, including the alliance, digital alliances, has grown close to 100% by in this uh, you know, nine months of performance, uh, where we are now working with digital partners uh, like Ola's and the uh, Vodafone, Make My Trips, Go Ibibos of the world. We also uh, you know, uh, make sure that our digital capabilities help us in reducing our cost and creating much better customer experience. <coughs> Today, about 66% of our uh, service is completely digitally led, uh, in spite of the fact that claims today is fairly uh, uh, of offline model in the industry. The other thing that we have done is to make sure that the health and other data points that we get from our high engagement model is used very effectively through our analytics capabilities across both the acquisition and the engagement stroke service uh, propensities. And lastly, to reduce the risk profile because fraud, waste, and abuse, as you know, is a high risk in our business. And our proprietary ML-based fraud uh, detection engine consistently helps us in making that claims uh, detection, the fraud detection very efficient. In summary, I'll say that we will continue to stay ahead of the market in terms of growth given the large opportunity that has unfolded, especially during COVID times and consumer propensity for health insurance. And the superior uh, you know, financial viability of our model will keep us ahead of the market in terms of our uh, bottom line results as well. I pass it back to Ajay now to take it ahead. Yeah, thank you, Manik. Uh, in concluding, let me just say that so we've seen sustained and strong growth momentum in our businesses over time in spite of all the disruptions and challenges we faced in the external environment. Whether you take a five-year perspective or look at growth over the last four Q3s or look at growth over the last nine months or indeed growth for this quarter over last quarter, we've delivered strong and profitable growth. This has come on the back of a clear and focused strategy on the key value drivers of each business, which I hope we've been able to explain to you in some detail today. So that remains our focus and endeavor going forward as well. And now we open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who would like to ask a question, please press star and one at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Kunal Shah from ICICI Securities. 
please go ahead yeah uh, congratulations for good set of numbers uh, across the board uh, so uh, firstly with respect to this entire digital lending uh, initiative and now uh, with that uh, scaling up uh, almost like uh, end of the, of the portfolio also the digital ecosystem portfolio is now around about 10 odd percent and uh, uh, 32% of the disbursements so maybe various uh, dynamics and uh, any regulatory impact which we are uh, seeing on that uh, because of either the first loss sharing uh, and any any impact which we'll see in the near term and uh, what is the contribution we can see uh, this portfolio will drive over next uh, 2 to 3 odd years first question was in terms of what is the regulatory impact of all uh, our agreements with, uh, with the ecosystem partners our bases uh, and every partnership is different and we have a different and customized uh, arrangement with them it bases the lead generation its collection efficiency risk uh, management so completely different for each partnership we don't see uh, any major impact uh, because of uh, any regulatory changes and as you can see, the, now it's contributing 32% of our retail uh, disbursements, new disbursements. It will continue to go up as we really drive our ecosystem and partnership and the entire uh, digital uh, space. So we, we will continue to see this going forward, um, going up uh, for now. Sure. And even in terms of the uh, credit cost profile uh, with this uh, proportion inching up, so any which way we had seen uptake in the retail GNP is, is it's now to almost like 3.7 odd percent. But should we then see that, okay, this is going to settle relatively higher and write-offs in the portfolio could be high. So credit cost in NBFCs will settle higher as the proportion goes up. No, uh, Kunal, <clears throat> I think, uh, and you will have to see at the risk adjusted returns, uh, the margins are also improving quite well. Also, this 3.7, which you see, you see in a year of a COVID, this is post the impact on the entire uh, environment, the economic environment, which you see. So we don't see this going up. Uh, in fact, it, once uh, economy normalizes, we should see this uh, stabilizing uh, slightly lower. Okay, even quarter on quarter retail was up, so not sure as to what would have led to that. Um, and even some bit on the large and mid corporate. However, encouraging you are saying that the 350, 375 odd crores will get resolved. So obviously we are on the downtrend. But what would be the reason for the uptick in the retail and the corporate uh, GNPS quarter on quarter? So this was primarily because of the restructured uh, pool which uh, flow forward, which had flown forward. That was the reason uh, for now. Okay, so primarily maybe it's the restructured which is getting into this. Yes, uh, so that was the primary reason. But uh, I think uh, collection efficiency is quite good on our restructured portfolio. So we don't see too much of risk on that. So if you look at uh, at a NDFC level, our uh, collection efficiency on restructured pool is closer to 94%. And within the in the retail segment, it's slightly lower, closer to around 90%, but it's very, very healthy for the restructured pool as well. Okay, okay, got that. Uh, secondly, on the housing finance, uh, uh, so affordable, I think this time we have participated even on, say, the prime as well as uh, uh, construction finance along with uh, uh, the affordable. So as and when the opportunity comes up, uh, would we see uh, the trend being there or this was more in terms of uh, uh, release uh, either to the, uh, maybe for the uh, completing the construction or even maybe to the existing customers on the prime side? How are we seeing this? Because actually when we look at it, maybe 50% is the affordable in the overall at this point in time. So how would be the participation as uh, the housing markets also get more conducive? So we are uh, completely committed to the affordable segment and we are looking at growing that, especially in our tier three and four markets. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, the construction finance which you see, uh, we do that to the affordable segment only and that's the reason you see the ticket sizes are pretty low. And as we move to tier three and four markets, uh, and if we have the opportunity, we will be able to participate in that. 
But overall portfolio, you should see it's 95% of the portfolio, which is the retail. Uh, sure. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thanks a lot and all the best. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Subramanian Iyer from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, congratulations on a good quarter. Uh, so uh, I have one data keeping question and uh, another one as well. Uh, so the data keeping question is, question is that if you could share the absolute amount of ECL uh, that you carry on an overall basis and also uh, if you can share what's the proportion of uh, restructured loans in stage one. Uh, and the other question I have is that assuming the economy normalizes in FY23, can we expect credit costs to be in the vicinity of uh, 50 to 75 basis points normalized? Second question, I think. Yeah. So can you just repeat the second question? I didn't quite understand the second question. Uh, yeah, uh, my second question was that uh, assuming the economy normalizes in FY23, uh, can we expect uh, credit cost to be in the vicinity of 50 to 75 basis points uh, normalized? So, uh, yeah, so if you look at majority of our portfolio is in stage two and the restructured because by definition the majority uh, as for the RBI guidance and the regulation, majority of the restructured portfolio will stay in stage two. And that's how it is for us. Um, uh, your second question, whether the normalized credit next year. So clearly we are looking at improvement in the credit cost uh, and the ECL next year once the economy normalizes and we are seeing all the macro indicators falling in line and the if you see the GST collection for the last uh, couple of months have been very, very strong. That clearly indicates the uh, economic uh, turnaround. So we see the credit cost uh, normalizing and coming down. But also we have to factor in that we are doing more retail and uh, digital by nature because the margins are much uh, higher. And as I mentioned earlier, the risk adjusted return is what we need to really look at. And that's... Uh, that's going to improve. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so I mean, uh, if it helps that if you could guide us to some, uh, uh, say, what is the fair level of credit cost to think in that business uh, and uh, for, for your overall business, NDFC business. Um, uh, and a follow up to that was uh, uh, you have seen quite a bit of operating profit, uh, pre provisioning profit uh, margin expansion uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, do you see more room for that as well? So, uh, so Bu, as we grow our retail and SME business, to, uh, right now it's 60% of our overall book is retail and SME, and the way it is growing, is growing much faster than the other segments. So as we continue to grow the retail and SME, our margin expansion should happen. So clearly we are looking at um, better margins. Um, Understood. Thank, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question at this time. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Khanna from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, this is Abhishek Sarab, this side. So, sir, I had a few questions from life insurance side. So, if you can help me understand uh, what has uh, been the uh, the recent development in the on the reinsurance side for term life, because many of our peers have seen activity that pri prices have been hiked and reinsurance thresholds have been changed. So, what has been uh, the situation at uh, uh, RN? And secondly, we are targeting like 14% VNB margin by the end of this year. So if you can just help me understand how are we going to achieve that from around 11.5% for uh, till nine months. So these two questions, sir. Thanks. Yeah, hi. So on uh, your first question on reinsurance, uh, uh, I think reinsurance premiums have gone across the board and they've gone uh, by about 40 to 50% up. All of that is reflecting in uh, increase in the prices. 
Uh, we've also filed our products in one for filed it with the regulator uh, for the increase in price. Uh, and prices have gone up in the range of you know 25% to 30% up in the market split. Uh, so that is the impact of reinsurance and the term business in the market. We'll see the acceptability of those increased prices and what it will do to the protection business. We'll get a better idea of that after about three months' time. So that's the one on reinsurance. Uh, on your question of net margins, uh, uh, net VND margins, typically, uh, if you see our trend, uh, last time when we achieved, say, by the end of the year, about 10.5%, at Q3, we were at about close to 5.5%, 6%. Uh, you know, your costs are distributed equally through the year, but obviously your uh, volumes sh shift significantly in quarter three and quarter four. Uh, so both our gross margins are being stable uh, at this point of time, and the cost that will be lesser because it is equally distributed, whereas the top line will be significantly higher. We'll see us achieving that 14% net VLG margin, which we said is you know one year ahead of our uh, projected uh, thing that we had said last time. So that's how we we'll achieve that 14% net VLG margin. Certainly, thanks a lot. So basically, it will be mostly operating leverage which will play out in the fourth quarter, and not yes. necessarily the product level margins or the product mix as such. The product level margins are pretty healthy. Like I said, we are close to about 43%. I don't see that changing or, or, or going down. In fact, with interest rates going up, there could be some positive bias on that uh, in that sense because interest rates are going up and there is a part of your business you do where interest rates going up actually help you in terms of your overall margin. Uh, so at best, there could be some kind of an upward bias. Uh, Mr. Sara, please confirm if you have any other question. We cannot hear you. Yes, so yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, so I have been uh, very clear, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, is it? Is it better? Uh, slightly better. If you can come, come closer to the phone, it will be great. Thank you. Sure. So, thank you. Uh, it's an interesting and also on the with the bond as much as the what is Sorry, I couldn't hear your question very clearly, but whatever I understood, the yeah, threshold limit for uh, protection on your book lakhs to 40 lakhs, and that's what we intend doing. So 20 will become 40 because that's part of the uh, arrangement with the reinsurer with all uh, life insurance companies by and large, apart from the increase in the price. And I heard you ask the question on non-par. Uh, I didn't get the question fully, uh, but what we do, if you ask from a risk management point of view, then we very efficiently do FRAs in terms of our hedging. And obviously, when we knew that the interest rates were going up, we actually took a breather because, I mean, typically at that point of time, there was a clear indication that interest rates would be going up. So we efficiently managed that. And at the current rates, uh, uh, we have gone back to our uh, FRA hedging uh, principle that we follow, where 100% uh, of our expected maturity benefits are uh, fully hedged from that perspective. Sure, that's very helpful. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of the next question is from the line of Anand Bhavnani from White Oak Capital. Please go ahead. Anand Bhavnani, your line is unmuted. Please go ahead with your question. Yes. Opportunity. Uh, two questions from my end. One is with regards to the uh, reinsurance question earlier participant asked. In our case, what is the uh, you know, a some assured level beyond which do we reinsure and have we increased that uh, limit, like the retention limit, in order to accommodate some of the reinsurance price increases? Yeah, so to answer to your first question, the uh, price increases which have come from the reinsurance now requires a mandatory movement, bulk of us for at 20 lakhs, 
has to move to 40 lakhs. Plus that we filed uh, uh, right now is with the 40 lakhs uh, reinsurable uh, uh, risk on us and balance will, will be with the reinsurer. We priced it for that. Uh, also, different income segments uh, reflect different behavior in claims. That's how the pricing has been uh, impacted in the marketplace. We are evaluating that for a certain income segment, can we take the uh, risk on our books slightly higher, but that's under evaluation. But for the products filed uh, with the regulator, uh, whatever is the bare minimum requirement of the reinsurer, 40 lakhs is what it has been filed for. Noted, noted. And with regards to our digital partnerships, you indicated that 32% of retail is originated uh, through these partnerships. What percent of this sub 32%, what percentage would have FLDG currently? So we don't have FLDG. The, I think our arrangements are, uh, uh, every partnership is different and we have a different arrangement with different partners. We have a lead generation uh, agreement, agreement. We have collections, risk management. So it's a combination of all. So that's how we look at uh, each partnership. Sure. And if, if I may, you know, just seek a bit clarification, how does any prospective change by RBI on FLDG affect our plans for digital origination? So we don't take FLDG. So that's, okay. uh, that's a point which I was mentioning. This is hmm. uh, related to lead management, collection efficiency or the collection uh, uh, arrangement which we have or risk sharing which we have. So there's nothing which is FLDG we take from the partners. Noted. And one last question if I may squeeze in. On our health insurance, uh, we have you know significantly improved on combined ratio to 113. Uh, what, at what level of you know uh, individual premiums uh, or, or overall cross return premiums do you see this uh, coming uh, you know below 100? That that's a function of the growth rate also. So you know it's it's, it's you know as you get close to 2,000 you know crores of premium, you know technically your you know, book becomes reasonably large to uh, move towards profitability. And and that's something you know and, and regarding growth opportunities, we can continue to evaluate them and see uh, you know where we would like to invest. Uh, but I think the the fact that in quarter four we have given as a guidance for break even without COVID claims. I think that should demonstrate the efficacy of the model, uh, and which effectively means that for quarter for the sans COVID claim, we will be below 100% uh, combined ratio. Noted. Thank you, sir. I'll come back with you for additional questions. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sahaj Mittal from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, sir, so uh, pardon me, uh, but I uh, missed out on on the price hike uh, question. So, what is the price hike which we have taken on our protection products? Um, if you could uh, just reiterate that. So, I said there are two products uh, which we have. One of them has already gone up by uh, fifteen percent uh, at this point in time, and the one that is filed with the regulator is for a price hike of about. Uh, 25 to 26 percent. We are waiting approval on that. So that's the range of uh, price hikes that we do, and the price hikes that happen in the market are a function of uh, two elements: what is the risk that you will take on your books, uh, and what is the extent of policies that you write medically and non-medically. Because in the industry, some of the large players write uh, close to 30 percent to 35 percent uh, of their business on non-medical basis and the reinsurance premium for that has gone up uh, uh, close to double of what it used to be before. Uh, but at ABSLI, we write about 98% of our policies uh, completely medically. Uh, so we've impacted the price hike based on the nature of the business that we do, keeping the risk in mind of the protection business. You got it. And in terms of price hike from the reinsurer, so uh, have uh, have we passed on that entire hike to the customers, or are we uh, will we take uh, it gradually, or uh, I mean, will it be margin accretive? Uh, 
i mean uh, the the question i'm trying to answer uh, ask is that since we have increased our uh, retention ratio it should ideally be margin accretive right because that increases the portion of protection on our books so how will it be for us yeah, it's not uh, you know it's not as simple because the moment you take the risk on your books and you know nobody knows uh, when the post covid scenario is going to unfold typically i am saying when claims come in you'll actually uh, shell out a larger from your books also so uh, it's not necessarily if the risk on your books you take large it has to be managed with a reasonable risk reward kind of an equation uh reinsurance premiums uh, whatever uh, have gone up would actually warrant for uh, maybe price hikes in the range of slightly more than uh, what we are passing on uh, there is also with the regulator uh, a belief that you should do it slowly so normal expectation is you shouldn't pass on more than say about 25% at one time so within the contours of that what you can do best will what is what will make it value accretive like i said fortunately because we do about 97 98% of our business medically uh, even if we are passing on between this 15 to 25% price hike it will turn out to be value accretive uh, for us for sure but like i said for people who do medical non medical in the ratio of say 60 40 uh, i can tell you for sure that uh, 25 30% price hike will not be good enough to have a value accretive margin of course you can make it value accretive by significantly increasing the risk on your books uh, but you know with the environment the way it is right now and nobody knowing when the covid scenario will unfold i'm not sure whether it's a very prudent uh, risk adjusted strategy or not got it thanks for answering all those questions uh, and all the best thank you thank you the next question is from the line of satya from intelsense capital please go ahead hello sir uh, can you hear me yes sir yeah. we can hear you okay thank you thank you for the opportunity um, my, my first uh, question is on housing finance i see the collection efficiency is 96% and restructured is roughly 7% this this i mean collection efficiency seems a little bit low and restructured seems a little bit high compared to industry so can you please uh, give some color on it and then how how do you see it moving in let's like, say q4 and then fi23 if if you can you know provide some guidance there so uh, we cater to the self employed segment uh, and that that segment has got impacted because of covid over the last couple of years and that has reflected uh, in the restructured portfolio which you are talking about but we are quite comfortable and if you look at uh, the quarter three performance has been quite stable and uh, so going forward uh, we see a stable stability in the overall portfolio quality okay and 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 how how do you see these numbers next year sir fy23 both collection efficiency and restructure collection efficiency should continue to improve uh but in terms of uh, restructured uh, portfolio i think by definition uh, once the account is restructured it has to remain in stage 2 until unless the customer repays 20% and all so that will take some time before the account gets upgraded to stage 1 okay and 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 this is i mean this which which segment this is for this is largely lap or or which segment is this restructured so this is primarily the home as i said uh, we cater to the self employed segment and uh, across home loan and lap of both so this is uh, across both the products okay okay and so my second question is on nbfc in 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 that one can you give uh, gross slippages uh, recovery grade if if you have the split so basically get this number offline okay okay and 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 did you sir say that the the entire 3.9% of the restructured sits in stage 2 majority of it sits in stage 2 okay so so stage 2 plus stage 3 combined is roughly 10 11% that is the stress is is that a fair way to look at it so so how did you get the 10% number so 3.9 uh restructured portfolio in nbfc and 3.9 uh, stage 
So restructured analysis around 7.8. Okay. Okay. And 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 restructured election efficiency is 94 percent. Is is did I hear that right? Just just to get yes. the number right. Yes. At the company level, that's 94 percent. At a retail level, that's around 90 percent. Okay. Okay. And 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 sir, uh, I I see 40 percent uh, PCR in NBFC book. So this is this is the level. Do we expect to maintain uh, in FY23 also and in general? No, so you are talking about the PCR forty-two percent. That's the question. Yeah, yeah. What is the? I mean, I mean, is, would this number be higher now with with the changing product mix? This will be lower. How how will this number move? So our overall portfolio is eighty percent secured, and it's in line with, and we are very comfortable with the provision coverage which we have at this point in time. But based on the performance of the portfolio and the restructured portfolio, we will continue to. uh improve our provision cover so this this number will go up next year structurally or 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 you will observe the bucket movements and then you will take a call and by ecl yeah so this all is defined by ecl policy under indias we have a ecl policy which is well established and it has been built over a period of time based on the performance of last 10 to 12 years and looking at, at the worst case scenarios which we Build the ECL policy. So this is uh, the PCR is this is our uh, ECL policy which we have. But okay. to your answer, if uh, if we see uh, the restructured uh, portfolio performance, uh, uh, we will uh, we will evaluate that, and if there is a need, we we will up that. Okay. Okay. Thank you for answering my question, sir, and the so forth. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhijit Tibrawal from Mutila Loswal. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for taking my question. And sir, I joined you a little late, so please excuse me. This question has already been uh, covered earlier. Uh, so just just one question, and and again, um, maybe I'm asking a question on your earnings call for the first time. So again, excuse me if I sound a little naive. So I mean, if you were to just kind of try to kind of calculate. Uh, back calculate rather uh, the the respective valuation of your lending businesses effectively from your market cap if you were to kind of reduce the the valuation of your um, AMC life insurance and maybe the health insurance companies I mean the 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 the, the maybe the effective price to book uh, at which I mean the lending businesses. Uh, the the valuation that the, the lending business get is is actually I mean very close to the book value, and to that extent I mean I would say which is very undemanding valuations. So I mean I mean I would say I mean ever since I mean ILFS happened right, there has been this this notion that anything wholesale, which in your case is large and great. Uh, is 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 a taboo for for the NBFCs. So if I if I were to just ask you a simple question, that I mean, how is it that we can give more comfort on this margin with corporate book? Um, that that will be all from from my answer. So I'll answer that question in two parts. I think like you yourself re referred, this is happening now for the last four years. So I think you've had four years to see how this book is performed, and I think that is obviously already there in the in the numbers that you see. That is point one. And point two, I think you've mentioned before, and I'll mention again because I've, we haven't got that data point on in, in this presentation. But the average rating of our corporate book is A minus. So actually, it's a very highly rated and well performing book. And like I said, you know, people have seen the performance of this book now over over a very long period of time. so uh, i'm not sure what else i can answer to to augment that uh, that answer right so sir, i mean the only thing is i mean like i said right i mean whatever i mean valuations are being ascribed to the lending business i mean at least in in our conversations a lot of it kind of stems from uh, the concerns which are there around this large and mid corporate book and like i said i mean though though the expectations were there Since the last three four years, since since that ILFS report happened, but nothing has really transpired. So I mean, that that that's precisely what I was kind of trying to understand. That's all, sir. Yeah, I think I've shared my perspective with you on that. As I said, there's enough time to see the performance of the book, and our rating in that book is actually A minus. So it's a it's a very good quality book. 
and we are very comfortable with the portfolio so essentially i mean i mean let's say even when you do that uh, watch list kind of an analysis on that large and mid corporate book you you're really not seeing any any stress which could be there i mean in the maybe coming year not not looking very far ahead but at least in terms of your watch list i mean is there anything no so we are not looking at um, anything significant coming from this portfolio as we have mentioned in the deck we are in fact looking at a resolution of uh, overall 350 to 3, uh, 370 crores of stage 3 assets so i think completely looking at improving it yeah and if you look at what's happened to the segment itself we reduced the size of the of the of the corporate book i mean you can see over from the peak is down almost 5 and 1/2000 crores and we reduced the average ticket size so even from a risk perspective those two metrics have also kind of played out the absolute number has come down and the average ticket has come down so both of those would also improve the you know the risk in addition to the a minus rating that i discussed earlier nice sir Sure, sir. This is this is useful. Thank you so much, and wish you the very best. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Anand Bhavnani from White Oak Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, the question is on our upcoming book. Now, in the budget, uh, the credit taking subsidy scheme has been kind of withdrawn for an area, then also for the rural area. So, if you can give us a sense of, you know. we have an ambitious target of taking the affordable housing book to i think 65% of the housing book so does how does that target uh, get impacted in the light of withdrawal of credit link subsidy scheme and in our existing affordable housing book if you can also share what percentage of clients have uh, applied or received credit link subsidy scheme in the past so so we we can come with uh, more details on this but if you look at uh, the focus of the government is on the affordable segment and this uh, budget also they have announced 48000 crores of uh, uh, investment or uh, so clearly we are looking at this segment more from a strategic point of view as majority of the customers in affordable are the first time buyers um, and uh, expansion in tier 3 and 4 cities really means that we are looking at this segment so that's how we are looking at yes subsidy um, might have uh, gone up and uh, because it would have got over the budget so we will have to get into the details of that but i think the entire focus of the government to drive the affordable housing really ensures that uh, there's a lot of opportunity which is there in this uh, business sure uh, i'll reach out separately for the number of customers who have existing you know uh, cls uh, scheme benefit yeah we shall have to give you pma why we will come back to you on that thank you thank you ladies and gentlemen due to time constraints that was the last question for today i now hand the conference over to mr ajay shrinivasan chief executive aditya bella capital for closing comments Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, call, everyone. Uh, we hope you've answered your questions. If there are any pending questions, uh, please do send in your questions to Pramod Bora. We'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you, and have a good day. Thank you. On behalf of Bella Capital, that can this conference. For your queries, you can reach out to Investor Relations Team. And we can now connect you.